Yeah, you can't connect the dots going forward. Like you just can't. But you can always connect them looking back. So with that, when I look back, I see all the dots connecting. I don't know about going forward because <laughs> that's still in progress. I'm still creating all of that right now. But um, it's been a journey. I have a lot of amazing people that I've met along the way who've been those jewels, who've been those breadcrumbs, you know, and really and truly it is the relationships. It's the people, you know, and going, making the time to like go to invest in yourself into these programs helps you so much in terms of the masterminds and like going to conferences and getting into programs like that sort of really helps you to just get around people who are doing like amazing things, things that are similar to you, things that are different from you, they're further ahead or, you know, just getting started. But ultimately you just have, you can learn so much from them. Hey guys, welcome back to Ask Me How I Know. I'm so excited. I've been waiting for this moment to have Lisa on my podcast. And Lisa Hilton, I am so grateful to, that you have time to share with us an expertise. Yeah, I'm so happy to be on. I love, I love seeing your podcast as a fellow podcaster out there on social media. So I'm excited to be here. It's so fun. And we've had a ton of off air conversation about everything under the sun. I think we've solved a lot of problems. Um, <laughs> and, and now, you know, I just want to jump right on in because we were talking just a moment ago about funds yes. and oh my gosh, they're like all the rave. Everybody wants to have a fund right now in the real estate world. And we're talking about some of the pros and the cons and um, let's go ahead and unpack this octopus of a vehicle, right? Yes, <laughs> totally. So yeah, I think this is such a cool conversation to have because, um, you know, there are like funds, I feel like funds are all the, all the craze. I keep seeing new funds popping up, like in the sense that like syndicators, choosing to raise a raise for a fund instead of sort of just raising for one particular deal. Um, and I think that it's cool to like sort of explore like what some of the pros and the cons are in terms of like that particular strategy. Um, I think the first thing to know is like a lot of funds you want as an investor, and this is from the investor's point of view, not from the person who's creating a fund. Like that's, the, there are pros and cons to that too, but we can explore that, I guess, another time. But um, for an investor, it's like number one, understanding like, is this fund going to have continuous cap calls after they call the first capital call? Um, because a lot of funds typically run where you have a commitment and you, you know, you commit like say hundred K, but then you only fund 25,000 now. And then later down the road, they'll, you'll fund the next amount. Or you also have funds where it's set up where the general partner can choose to call for more money later on because um, like maybe for management fees or for any kind of expense that comes up. Um, so you just want to like sort of read the documentation to make sure that you sort of understand like what your, like what the general partner is entitled to do when you enter into a fund. Um, and to the extent that you don't, then you could be in a situation where your shares are sort of diluted. Um, and to be honest with you, I think that's probably true with a single LLC as well. Um, but with a fund, the other, uh, the other pro, which can be a pro and a con is the pro is you're able to diversify within that fund. So like if it's a blind fund, that fund can then buy like several different types of investments based on its investment strategy and its plan. Um, whereas when you're just investing in one LLC, like you're just in that particular LLC in that particular investment. So that's something to consider. It's, it's both a pro as well as a con. You get the diversification, but then the con side of it is that sometimes one asset might hold up the fund from closing because it's just hard to sell. So like you'll just end up sitting in this fund and then expenses keeps going and et cetera, et cetera. So just some things to note. 
I would say, as an investor thinking about funds. That's really interesting. Now, do I get the same perks and advantages as an investor? This is a question that I've heard and I've heard different answers to, but because you are in this space, this is your, you know, day to day and you work in, you know, I mean, you are working with funds on a daily basis right. in the real estate um, sphere. So, you know, what am I losing some of my advantages, um, the tax advantages and such, if I'm invested in a fund versus a single LLC attached to a real estate holding? So that's a great question. The first thing I'll say is like, I am not giving any tax advice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's the right. first thing I'm going to say. We're just um, having a conversation. So this is just people. a conversation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then number two, I think that everyone's tax situation is different. So you definitely want to talk to your tax professional. Um, but the third thing is like, you know, by and large, I think it's by and large similar. I don't really work specifically on like the tax aspect of the funds. Um, I'm more like on reporting. So it's a little bit different. Um, so I don't know the ex real extent. I feel though that it's probably quite similar in terms of like um, the tax benefits. Okay. Okay. Without knowing the details. So yeah. Okay. Okay. That is so interesting. And like you said, I'm, you know, I mean, funds are all the craze right now. Yes. And, and I think that that's going to be, you know, another double-edged sword where it's going to do a lot of good because it's going to bring in a lot of new investors that might yeah. not have the capital to, you know, put that 50, 100 K investment down, but it's such a bridge to um, a group of people especially, I mean, it's a bridge for everybody, but that's part, that's, that's my heart. I'm like, oh, look at other people. It's like, yeah. this is the barrier to entry. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think the last item I would say is like the expense ratio, just like people and thinking like as a passive investor, looking at index funds, right? You want to like look for the index funds, like you're looking at the returns, but then you're also looking at the expense ratios that the different index funds have, and maybe even like say the management fees and that kind of stuff. Um, when you start choosing to invest in like a fund like that, then you also want to look at what are the expense ratios. So like if they are thinking that whatever expenses they envision that they're going to be having, um, you want to sort of get a, a feel for those expense ratios to, you okay. know, get an understanding. So, yeah. Are there some norms that we can, are there any norms around that? This is something I have not personally explored too much. So like, would it be fair to say, you know, if you saw something that was like 75% on the load, you know, I, I'm just saying, like, yeah. what would someone who has no experience with this, how would they be able to know if it was reasonable? Yeah, that's a good question. It's honestly, that's a challenging to say because yeah. it really depends on what the fund plans to invest in. Like if the fund has been set up, to just invest in two properties and that's it. So just like, you know, an LLC that's doing two properties and that's it. So then that's done, right? Now you're just dealing with the property expense and that kind of stuff. But then if you have a fund that's gonna be active, so like you have invested, but they're gonna take, like they're raising say a, a million dollars and they're gonna buy several assets with it, then that makes it a little bit different because like, there might be legal fees and tax fees and audit fees. And like, you know, depending on how big the fund gets, like it's going to need to, it's, it might fall into some different kinds of regulations, which is going to require it to have all these different expenses. Whereas if you think about a, a typical syndication LLC, like you buy the investment in the very beginning. And that's like, yes, you have the property related expenses, um, but by and large, like, you know, you're not dealing with like an audit fee, for instance. Um, so it's like things like that, that makes that it's added things to consider. It doesn't make it bad. It's just, you just need to know that there's some other things to, to think about and understand. You understand this so well. I, I appreciate <laughs> it because for me, it's still, I've had a, you know, a few conversations about funds with different, you know, people in the real estate investment space. Right. And every time I pick up something new, but 
you can always tell the people that are fluent in fund in fundies. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a good world. It can be very lucrative for investors and then also for the general partners as well. So it's definitely, uh, it can be a, definitely a great investment without a doubt. Yeah. And I like the diverse on the, on the bright side, and you've mentioned this, but the diversification that can happen yes. within that fund can really provide a lot of stability and other yeah. benefits. Exactly. Are there exactly. any other benefits that you would say that, you know, I think connected to that diversification is you have a general partner that is going out and looking for deals on your behalf. So you don't end up having to look for the like multiple general partners, you know, like when you're as a passive investor in syndications, like, okay, you found this partner, you really like them. Um, and they might just only focus on like, say multifamily, right? So then if you want to have exposure in industrial, then you then have to find another partner who probably does that. Or so that's, where like the fund would probably be more attractive because a fund could have the strategy of like, say, value add, like that's their strategy, or maybe their strategy is opportunistic. So the value add is going to buy hotels, multi multifamily, um, everything that could, you know, with the idea that they're going to buy the property, add value and sell it in the next couple of years. Um, opportunistic, these are properties that um, they're actually developing. So these are development projects. So the funds are a little bit different in the sense that they don't generate any operating distributions, right? Um, the Because you're developing, so you're under development. So until that the property is then fully developed and then sold, then you most likely will then get your money. Whereas the value add funds are kicking off cash every, every month, every quarter, making distributions out to investors. Um, so yeah, I think it's sort of connected to diversification because yes, you get to diversify your asset classes, um, but in connection with that, you don't end up having to do the diversification yourself because you have this general partner that you trust. So it's almost like you've built this relationship with this trusted general partner who's then going to take over with managing the, your your money. That's really a great way of expressing it. Um, yeah. You know, because it is nice to be able to do kind of one-stop shopping and say, great, yeah. Lisa, I trust you. In fact, I've already participated in this apartment complex that right. you had, and I love how you managed it. You did a killer job executing that business plan because you're a rock star. Right. And you know, the next thing you know, you have this fund and I know you like, you trust you, great experience yep. where my friend has. And now, wow, you're going to do this with mobile home parks. You might do this yeah. with hotels you might do this with apartments you might do yeah the sky's the limit on whatever that fund is is tailored to exactly exactly so lots of really so lots of pros and lots of cons <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's why there's so much ch chatter about funds <laughs> yes yeah oh. yeah they can be uh, to me I think they can be amazing vehicles you just need to know and understand like you know just come into it understanding with the right expectations. Like if you're in a development fund, you're not expecting operating distributions, right? right? So like understanding that and understanding that that fund might actually need to call some capital from you, you know, throughout the whole period because they're continuing to develop if that's their plan. So just understanding the business plan before sort of jumping in. So yeah, I think okay. that's important. I think that's great. And if I, if you don't mind, maybe you can offer clarification for me as I'm continuing to learn about funds. Mm -hmm. And that is if they're offering that one of the strategies with um, a fund, as I understood it was they're going to do some continual capital calls. And I don't know if that's exactly what they called it, but they, they, you would commit, say I'd commit to giving you a hundred thousand dollars into your right. fund, but you're not going to take my hundred thousand dollars all at once, right. which allows me to maintain, you know, I get possession of my money sure. if it's not going to be invested and you'll, t you'll call and say, okay, well, we're, we found something we're investing. You need to, you know, put in the 25 K or whatever it is. Right. Is that along those lines? of? Yes. So each okay. fund is different. 
So people have, there's so much flexibility in terms of what kind of fun you want to create. You can create a fund that only calls one time, which is like typical syndications. You know, you create that LLC, you call all, you get all the people, you know, you have conversations with investors. They say, yes, I want to invest. You know, you raise 2 million, 4 million, whatever. And then that's it. They don't put anything more in and they're they're good to go. They're just getting operating distributions. Um, however, there is the ability for funds to do something that where they can have people commit to the fund. So they, uh, once again, investors can, this fund could be a million dollar fund and investors are putting in, you know, different investors are committing different amounts, but say an investor is committed a hundred K a lot of times we're not calling for the 100K all at once. We're going to call like say 25, but then there's usually a period of like two to three years in the, in the fund's life, which is at the beginning where we're going to make all the investments. So that's the time period that you're on the hook for calls pretty much um, up to your commitment. Um, so you've committed 100K. So in the first three years, you want to make sure you have that money so that way you can um, send that money in when the cap calls come to you. Um, so that's typically how it, it generally works. But as I said, I think the most important thing is people have to read the fund documents when they're getting involved with a fund because there is no cookie cutter. Like the funds are so creative. Like you could have a fund that, as I said, you invest in the very beginning and you're done. You could have one where you commit um, and you put a portion of that investment in the beginning and then more over, you know, the first two to three years, all of that is always outlined in the limited partnership agreement, which is the LPA, which you'll get when you invest um, alongside your subscription agreement. So um, I think the key thing to take away regarding this question is that there isn't a specific answer. But what's more important is that it's really important to read the documents and understand what's required of you if you decide to invest in a fund and how it works. That is really, really wise advice. <laughs> yeah. and, and sometimes those documents can feel intimidating, but you can familiarize yourself and whoever is managing, running that fund, you right. can always go to that person and ask questions. And yes. And lots and lots and lots of questions. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so. you've been you've been so busy building an amazing business and launching a podcast um, and just continuing to grow. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what that looks like with that growth process and some of the things that you've learned that have worked out well and, and maybe some of the pains along the way. Sure, 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 sure. Um, uh, I would say that when I think about the last year, um, I would say growth comes with a lot of courage. Um, so courage, number one, um, uh, willingness to be uncomfortable. Um, so to experience discomfort and, you know, to keep going regardless. Um, and then I think the third thing is recognizing that every single experience brings you like another nugget, another like, like another nugget, another jewel, another, another direction to like another like uh, breadcrumb along your path to be like, oh yeah, you're on the right path. But like, you just got to keep going. Um, and before I get into like fully answering, I want to say that one, a quote that has been so dear to me recently that I heard was that you can't connect the dots um, going forward. You can only connect the dots going backwards. So like you oh, really. Wow. Wow. Yeah, if you, you stop and think about it, I mean, at first it's like, oh, cute quote. And then no, 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 no. You stop and you think about it. It's like, wow. Yeah. yeah. You can't connect the dots going forward. Like you just can't, but you can always connect them looking back. So with that, 
when I look back, I see all the dots connecting. I don't know about going forward because <laughs> that's still in progress. I'm still creating all of that right now. But um, it's been a journey. I have a lot of amazing people that I've met along the way who've been those jewels, who've been those breadcrumbs, you know, and really and truly it is the relationships. It's the people, you know, and going, making the time to like go to invest in yourself into these programs helps you so much in terms of the masterminds and like going to conferences and getting into programs like that sort of really helps you to just get around people who are doing like amazing things, things that are similar to you, things that are different from you, they're further ahead or, you know, just getting started. But ultimately you just have, you can learn so much from them. Um, so I would say the, the things that I have learned for me is, um, gosh, where do I start? <laughs> um, you know, as we were talking before the show, like, you know, the using virtual assistants, like, I think it's super, one thing I've learned is that you're going to need help in order to grow. Um, and to the extent that you, the better you get at delegating and being vulnerable enough to ask for help and hire for help, um, is the faster you're able to move in your business. Um, however, I think that connected to that is, in, is the importance of sort of taking the time to understand the systems and, and build systems. You know, everyone is different. But for me, what I learned was like once I understood, okay, this is how things work, like in terms of like even just posting things, having a plan to post on social media and all that stuff, like just understanding how all that stuff works, you then are then able to like be able to either supercharge that in terms of the system that you want to create for someone else to do that item for you. Um, and I think that's really important. And knowing that when you get started, you probably just don't know how to do this stuff. So sometimes you're going to have to pay someone to do it and in turn also teach you. So that way you know how to do it to the extent that something goes awry and they're unable to do it, you can still then deliver the content that you're trying to deliver to, you know, your audience. Um, I would say that's one of the things I learned. I also learned that it's, it's close to impossible to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> As there, we spoke about our laundry <laughs> list of all the things that we really like, uh, more, there's always more to do. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I think, this is also another quote or another saying that, you know, that women can have it all, but not all at the same time. Um, you know, it's not just women. I think men too. I think it's just people like we can have it all, but like, it's probably not going to happen all at the same time. Right. <laughs> so like, you know, taking, giving yourself a lot of grace, um, with the process, because we come in with like, I don't know about other people, but like as a type A, like you just have all these big dreams and like all these things that you want to do. And then you realize, okay, yeah, like not everything's going to get done right away. But like, that doesn't mean that you don't keep going towards it. Like, it's okay if some of this stuff doesn't come out, but you just, you learn a lot from the experience and you take the lessons learned and you, you run with it. And in the next go round, you're faster and more efficient because of the experiences you got. Oh, I love that. And you know, here's the thing. If we had it all at the same time, you can't enjoy it. It'd be like, you know, if I had this huge tub of ice cream, maybe I had like I don't even like ice cream all that much, but if I had like all my favorite flavors and I had a gallon of each in front of me, right. I couldn't enjoy them all. Like they're going to be melted before I can eat them all. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it's better to just have like a portion of it at a time and to just receive it and enjoy it and embrace it. And then let it go, throw the carton away, grab yes. the next one. <laughs> yes, totally, totally. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say, you know, um, being around, you know, good people, go, being around like-minded individuals helps you so much in terms of continuing to grow. Um, I feel like that has been so pivotal in, for me getting to where I am in my journey and continuing to grow. Like, I just always know that I need to constantly be in the community. So like 
being in masterminds around other people who are building businesses, you know, either, as I said before, they might just be starting out or they're further ahead, but like just being in that community of people is just so empowering. So somebody's listening right now and they're like, I, I know I need to be in this community. I don't mm-hmm. even know where to find it. Apparently yeah. they're not on social media. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. But you know, I mean, like to find a good mastermind, for example, yes, that can be a challenge. And oftentimes people don't know where to start, or maybe they see a program and that's very different than a mastermind group. So, sure. you know, how did you find a mastermind to be participate in or yeah. groups and communities in general? Sure. You know, so my first mastermind was the real estate investor goddesses. Um, so that's Monique. I love Kong. you, Monique. Kong. Yeah, Monique, Monique is awesome. <laughs> um, I, you know, like I wouldn't like I do credit her a lot for like starting out my journey because when I met her, I had none of these. None of anything that I'm doing now, I was not even thinking about doing. <laughs> did, you, okay, did you know that she's how I know about real estate syndication? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to have, I'm going to send this to money and just say, look that's at how are- I know about real estate syndication too. <laughs> These are two of your million women that you are reaching That's out right. to touch and change lives. Hundred <laughs> percent. Like when I met her, I was doing a landmark program. This was in twenty eighteen. I started the program. Yeah, twenty eighteen in the fall. I did the the forum, and she was in the forum. But I didn't know her. But I saw her. She went up to stage and whatever. And then it so happened that we were also in the next course and whatever that comes with it. Um, And then it just so happened that in that course, there was like many groups and I raised my hand to be a leader uh, that I would host a call for every week for like three months. Um, And so happened that she chose my call time. So then she was on my mini call for like three months. So that's how I got to know her. But I didn't, I didn't know that she was like a real estate investor because, you know, we were focused on the program and whatever. And in the end, someone said, one of the other girls, it was like six of us in the group. And one of the other girls go, oh, you know, we should all exchange business cards. And I, we were like, yeah, yeah. And then when I got hers, I saw she was a real estate investor. And I go, oh, my goodness. I didn't know you were a real estate investor. <laughs> um, and she was like, yeah. And then I go, okay. So I said, yeah, we need to connect. We need to connect because like, I'm really interested in real estate and everything. But I had her card and I put it in my bag and two or three months went by and I didn't call. Like I just got busy with life and right. I took a staycation um, and I was cleaning out my bag. I was just saying, you gotta be cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was cleaning out my bag and I ran across her card and I go, oh my goodness, I was supposed to message, I was supposed to reach out to Monique. And I finally did. And I called her up and I was like, can you tell me what is it that you do? And then that's when she shared. And I was like, wow. I was like, I didn't know that there were people that did this. I thought it was just like these big investment managers, like the one I work for that, like, this is like, I just thought it was for them. Like, I didn't know that there were people that are out there doing this. And she was like, yeah. And I go, wow. (laughs) So like my whole mindset got blown up because I was like, wow. Like I was thinking about buying single family and I was like looking, looking, looking for single families in like Alabama and Detroit and all these places. And I just couldn't pull the trigger because I had a very challenging experience, which I mentioned a bit in in the beginning show when I bought my first property and came in and I bought it because I loved it and I was young and I didn't quite understand like running numbers and all that stuff. And then once I got it, I quickly understood about the freaking numbers <laughs> and it wasn't cash flowing. And I was like, oh my God, this is painful. Um, held on to it for like five or six years. And I was an out of state. So I was living and came in the first year I had it. And then after that, I moved to Boston and I was in Boston for four years. And then I moved to LA and then I was in LA for, well, I've been in LA now for the past six years, but I want to say about two years after I'm a year or so after I moved to LA, I got a check. Well, I got an email that 
I had a bill for like over a thousand dollars for the AC breaking down and I wasn't making any money off of this property. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to get rid of this thing. And I finally sold it. And I was like, no more real estate. So when I was thinking about a couple, you know, two or three years later, um, I left public accounting to take a job working for an investment manager. And the group that I ended up in was a real estate, private equity, real estate. And I go, sure. Okay. So, you know, six months in, I was like, oh my goodness, like you can make money investing in real estate. Like clearly I was not doing it right. <laughs> was not doing it Ask right. me how I know. <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> I was not doing it right. So I was like, huh. So that's when I started like, you know, researching. I thought about house hacking and then I was like, okay, this is not for me, but maybe I could do turnkey. And then I was like, I tried looking for a while. And then I found, I met Monique. Like I wasn't looking for her. Like we were just at this place doing this stuff. And I was like, this works for me. (laughs) Perfect. And I love it. Now I'm like four in (laughs) (laughs) and they cash flow, and I'm great. I'm happy. So the one that I invested, the first one that she brought is actually going full cycle at the end of this month. So it's a beautiful world. I can't complain. No complaints. Can you imagine speaking of connecting the dots and looking back, right? I could, I'm picturing Pac-Man going gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> um, but you're connecting these dots looking backwards. I wonder what would have happened if you hadn't bought the house and came in and lost money on it. Yeah. Like, could you imagine the scale of buying an apartment complex because you love it and the scale, the magnitude of loss that could have happened? Like, yeah. you know, maybe it was a good way to have a lesson learned. Sure. Sure. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. So I think for me like that hundred percent. So now like, I think that's the part of me that always loves the numbers. Like I like (laughs) seeing the numbers on, on a deal and on an investment because like, you know, after that experience, you know, that it's possible to lose money investing in real estate. So like, you're always looking at the numbers and trying to understand like, what are some of the assumptions that people are making and whether you feel comfortable with those assumptions before investing. So yeah, definitely awesome experience. <laughs> Looking back now, I can say awesome, but in the moment it was definitely painful. <laughs> yeah. It, it's I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you learned that lesson early on, like in uh, with small numbers and everything. And honestly, that's what I have um, a mentor in my life and and he just challenges me on anything, yeah. any underwriting I bring that I say, you know, Hey, you know, when we forward this property or whatever, and, and he will ch- run me through the ringer. It's like the gauntlet, but I'm so grateful for it. It's so painful to, to, you know, really have people in your life that will challenge those numbers. You don't want to take mm-hmm. those numbers to investors, you know, right. and I don't want to take an investor down the wrong path, but you know, once you start doing that and you really recognize once, well, then you take that knowledge and you start looking at other people's underwriting yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, that's, those are interesting assumptions. Yes. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm not comfortable with that personally, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to each his own, you know, to yes. each his own. But yeah, yeah, definitely. That's- um, Yeah, I would also say that that experience, when I look back at it and when I look at how I invest now, like you know, I'm, I'm grateful that like I met Monique and that I got introduced to syndications. As I said, I'm in four to date at this point. And as someone who works a very demanding job, um, I'll never forget. I think it was the summer. It it was the Christmas of 2019, um, going into 2020. And I remember like at that point, I think I was in two deals and both of them, like for Christmas, they had kicked out their operating distributions. And I remember I was working late. It was near Christmas, working late, getting out operating distributions for the funds that I work on to investors um, and, you know, closing down for the night. And just before I closed down, going into my bank account, just to check every, you know, everything and seeing those operating distributions come in and saying, wow. The, you know, I love it. Um, so 
I'm really appreciative, you know, and even like for the sale of this property, um, when they announced it, I want to say it was like in early February and it was so like, it's right now is like busy season for me. Um, and like, if I had to be selling a property, like it would be very challenging <laughs> for me to be working full time and like focused on the stuff that I need to be focused on. And then also trying to sell a property that's in Atlanta. Like it would be, it would be right. challenging. It's not, not possible. It's possible to do it. It's just as a high performing professional, like they are generally focused on getting, you know, work done and getting stuff completed. So, yeah. And when, when somebody is spread too thin, I, I agree completely. It's nice to just know, you know, let's just face it. Getting distribution checks is just it's like Christmas. Yeah. Checks you know, every man. quarter <laughs> it's just like Christmas. It's like, this is great. I like this. <laughs> but, yeah. No know, complaints. <laughs> no complaints. But I also understand what they're doing to manage the property. Right. And, and there's a value there that comes to me where I can live the life that I want to live. Yeah. I can spend my time podcasting and doing all these other wonderful things sure. and looking for other assets that I want investors to invest exactly. in. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great way for me to, to continue building my business because then as I've invested passively, as I turn to build my business, like I have a keen understanding of what it me feels like to be a passive investor, because yep. I know like I am on the receiving end of being a passive investor on other people's deals. So as I work towards transitioning full-time into my business and, you know, being able to then provide that service to other people, like it gives me a frame of reference in terms of how to feel like walking in their shoes. I preach it. That was one reason my husband and I went back and forth a little bit on how to use our seed investment money. And we finally agreed that it was really important to invest passively first. And that's what question that a lot of people ask, you know, and then in the investment investing space, I'll say like, well, should I invest first or should I just, you know, put my money into my own investments? And there isn't a right or wrong answer, but for me, you know, it's like my husband and I worked through that question. It was, I want to know how my investors will feel. Like mm -hmm. I always want to walk a path first so that I can empathize and understand what are some yeah. of the questions that I would I would have, and what does it feel like to send money, <laughs> wire this money to, you know, somebody that I, yeah. I, I know, <laughs> you know, like, right. do I really know them? Are they really, you know? I'm, yeah. It's, it's a great experience. It is. It is. It helps you a lot, you know, cause I always remember when I wired the first 50, I always <laughs> remember it. Tell me know. the story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. So Monique, sh like we shared and, um, like what she, what her business was and like what she did and et cetera. Um, and then shortly thereafter, um, you know, she had a deal and she said, okay, you know, there's, I have a deal, et cetera. Here's the information. So I asked her a couple questions about, you know, what it was and everything. So then I then looked at it and I decided, okay, um, do I want to invest? So I felt comfortable with her because I had pre-existing relationship with her from, you know, from when I met her, um, you know, months before. You guys um, went to class. You guys were in classes together. You're on calls yes. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I had pre-existing relationship is more like about the deal and like, you know, the partner, her sponsor that she was partnered with. So I also researched them, you know, and they were fairly well known. So like I could find information very easily, very quickly about them. And then Atlanta was an, a market that I was really interested in investing in, um, but didn't like, this was a new kind of experience for me. So I looked at it. I also looked at like what the returns were going to be. Um, and like, what else? So yeah, I looked at what the returns, like what the fees were, like what fees they were taking as, you know, acquisition fee, management fee, that kind of stuff to see whether I was comfortable. Um, and yeah, so it just so happened that the market, I actually went to school in the University of Georgia. So I'm familiar with Atlanta. Um, so, you know, 
already familiar with the market, you know, familiar with Monique, got familiar with the sponsor, then got familiar with the numbers that I saw. And then I was like, okay, you know what? I think I want to invest. And then I was like, <laughs> um, I was like, okay, do I want to send this 50 K? And I was like, okay, you know, like wing. Um, so like, even though like I was good on investment and everything, it was just so like scary because I hadn't really sent 50 K of my own money. I've released big wires for work, but like not those kind of wires for myself. So, yeah. um, so yeah, it was a little nerve wracking to do it. And then once I did it, I was like, okay, it's out. And then once I saw the, um, operating distributions going, I felt comfortable. I was like, okay, yeah, things are moving along. Um, and then now the sale, I was just like, okay, got it. Can't complain. No, com yeah. no complaints. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. I remember, um, my husband calling and I was still a classroom teacher and my husband called from the bank and he's like, okay, um, I'm about ready to do it. I'm like, okay, great. Call me when you're done. <laughs> he calls back. He's like, that was so hard to do, you know, like so nerve wracking. And, and, you know, the next few days we kind of had those back and forth, like, well, this is exciting. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like getting a, um, a new broom or a new vacuum or something. Right. You know, you're like, I know that this is really great. I know it's going to be good, but I, I don't see the results necessarily right now. Sure. You know, um, maybe a new broom or vacuum isn't the best analogy to get to <laughs> use them and see them, but you kind of still have that new sensation of like, it's going to be good, but is it going right. to be good? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause you know, there's no guarantees with investing, yeah. be it real estate or the stock market or whatever else people invest in, there's just no guarantees. So there is some level of uncertainty there. Um, but yeah, you know, it really comes down to, you know, really understanding like the team, the team that you're investing with, you know, cause ultimately you're trusting them with your money to make the right decisions on the investment in terms of managing it day to day and then ultimately making the decision on to when to sell it. So yeah, yes, super important. It is. Lisa, I have thoroughly enjoyed having you on Ask Me How I Know. I just glanced at the time as always and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I want to give you an opportunity. Is there, are there any other gems or nuggets that you would like to um, just plop on the audience before we say goodbye uh trying to think um no I think that you know I said everything that I felt <laughs> you know so like um in terms of the recap on the funds like just funds are not bad you just need to read and understand like what's going on and just make sure you ask questions and understand like what's going on I think that's the key thing um, because they can be extremely good for building wealth. Um, if you can find a good GP who's going to take care of your, just like any regular syndication. Um, so yeah, I think that was the key things. And then, you know, my story of investing passively, you know, definitely it's nerve wracking for everyone. Um, the first one and maybe even multiple ones after that, like it doesn't necessarily go away. Um, there's always risk in investing. You can always lose your money, um, but you can do as much as you can to mitigate it in terms of research and like investing in the right markets and really getting to know your sponsor team before deploying that capital. So, so yeah. that is so awesome. Here's the best part about this. I do not get to always say this, but today I get to say, if you love everything Lisa, like I do, then you can go and listen to her podcast. Yes. So anything that you feel like, like, oh, wow, I want to hear Lisa talk. Just go over to Lisa's podcast and, you know, and just enjoy and learn even more. And yeah, um, because that would be wonderful. Can you go ahead and give our audience like that an opportunity, the best place um, to connect and the name of your podcast and everything? Because 
off the top of my head, I'm like, I'm not yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. So yeah, if you want to learn more information, um, you can head over to my website. Actually, um, something that I have for all my visitors that come to my website is um, a seven day passive investing made easy series. Um, because hey, let's face it. It sounds very daunting to make that first passive investing investment. Um, you might have a lot of questions. So I created this quick, easy email series, seven days that breaks down making passive investing easy. So you just go to lisahilton.com and that's Hilton with a Y. So it's just like the hotel, only thing with a Y.com. Um, and then you can check it out. And then my podcast is called the Level Up REI. And I have episodes every Tuesday. Um, and then the first Thursday of every month, I have conversations with passive investors. So I bring on fellow passive investors to share their stories of passively investing in all types of real estate. So yeah, I love it. I love all the different series. They're amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show, Julie. It, it was awesome. Thank you. It's just been such a joy, pure yeah. joy. <laughs> <laughs> um, lovely audience. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting this podcast. If you haven't, please share this episode with somebody that, you know, might be interested in passive investing because it can feel like a mystery and it's really not that mysterious. It's just that there's oftentimes a lack of, um, of education or understanding. Right. And just by some simple steps, you can have clarity and feel very confident about taking the next step. So go ahead and share this with someone that you care about and um, check out Lisa's website for more information on passive investing. And until next time, go find your freedom. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Ask Me How I Know. This episode was brought to you by Three Keys Investments. They are dedicated to helping people like you, yeah, you, my awesome listeners, develop passive income and legacy wealth through multifamily investing. Feel free to check out their website, threekeysinvestments.com, to see if there is an offering that will help your portfolio grow and meet all of your needs. If you haven't already rated, reviewed, subscribed, liked all of those bells and whistles, I would be absolutely honored if you would do that for Ask Me How I Know. Thanks again and go make it a great day.